Hey, what is going on guys? Danny here, hope you've all been doing well. In this video, we'll be taking a look at the EVGA GeForce GTX 1080 Ti, a monster of a graphics card that brings with it some impressive performance figures. Let's start off by looking at what comes inside the box accommodating this lovely graphics card. First off, you get this fairly large movie style poster, which looks awesome if you ask me. Next, you've got your usual paperwork, such as your user manual, warranty information, some stickers, a case badge, and a driver's disc. I still wonder why they even include those because you should ideally be downloading and using the latest drivers from Nvidia's website. Lastly, they've also included some Molex 6 and 8 pin VGA power connectors in case your power supply doesn't come with those connectors. However, if your power supply doesn't natively come with those connectors, you should really think about upgrading it before even using a high-end GPU like this. Moving on to the specifications, this card is using a GPU based on the GP102 chip of the Pascal architecture. It has 3584 CUDA cores, 224 texture mapping units, and 88 render output units. The GPU out of the box has a core clock of 1556MHz and a boost clock of 1670MHz, which is 70MHz higher than the stock Founders Edition 1080 Ti. In terms of VRAM, this card has 11GB of GDDR5X memory with an effective memory clock of 11,016MHz, a 352-bit memory interface width, and a memory bandwidth of 484GB per second. Powering the card is one 8-pin and one 6-pin VGA power connectors, and this card has a TDP of 250 watts, quite impressive considering what this beast of a card can do, but more on that later. Next up, I'll be talking about the design of the cooler and the aesthetics of this card. EVGA has stepped up their game from when the 10 series Pascal cards launched with their ACX 3.0 coolers. This card is using EVGA's new ICX cooler, offering great cooling performance and ensuring that all of the graphics card's components, not just the GPU, but components such as your VRMs, memory chips, and power delivery are all adequately cooled with no compromises. The card uses an optimized airflow fin design, which allows for direct airflow through the aluminum fins. The fins are also L-shaped, which EVGA claims this design was chosen to increase surface contact and thermal dissipation. The base and back of the card are using die-cast plates, which make direct contact with all the vital components as I mentioned earlier. This was a much needed improvement over the older ACX coolers, which was why EVJ was sending out free thermal pads to users who had issues with cooling. They have completely solved this problem with these back plates, which are using an integrated heat pipe, which maximizes cooling performance and significantly lowers temperatures. This cooler also has two ball bearing fans, which cool sufficiently, providing a good amount of airflow all the while staying very quiet when under load. And here's a great thing about this cooler, and something I'm sure all of you can appreciate, especially as Salai users and ITX case owners. The ICX cooler has a very efficient design, only taking up two slots whereas other aftermarket cards take up to two and a half or even three slots. This is not the case with just the SE Black Edition, in fact EVGA's Triple Fan for the Win 3 card is also using a 2 slot cooler, making space management easier and reducing GPU sag. You have to commend them for that, as the temperatures I experienced from playing around with this card were fantastic for such a minimalistic design. Speaking of minimalistic, the card's aesthetics can be appreciated from a simple design standpoint. Looking at the front of the card, the shroud looks unique but quite attractive, a design that I have never actually seen on a card before. The shroud doesn't have any aggressive angles or flashy color accents, which is fine if you're looking for a neutral setup. The shroud looks like it's made of metal because of the black metallic finish, but it's actually plastic. Although it felt quite solid and sturdy in my hands, it wasn't flimsy and you could tell there was a quality finish to it. At the front side of the card, you have 5 heat pipes which are protruding out from the heatsink with an SC logo off to the side that does light up. Looking at the top of the card, this is the orientation that's most commonly used in most cases. And here we can see more of the heatsink along with a nameplate that has the EVGA branding and GeForce GTX 1080 Ti. It's fairly wide and large which is one of the first things that jumps out at you when looking at the PC with the card installed. Aside from that, we have one 6-pin and one 8-pin VGA power connectors. At the back of the card, there's the die-cast back plate which I talked about earlier, which covers the entire board of the card. It looks pretty simple and has a matte black finish to it. The EVGA logo is also present here, along with more of the GeForce branding at the bottom. There are no RGB customizable LEDs on the back plate. In fact, the only parts of the card that illuminate is the nameplate at the top and the SC logo at the front side. 
Moving around to the rear of the card, we have three DisplayPort 1.4 connectors, one HDMI 2.0B connector, and one Dueling DVI-D connector. Overall, the card doesn't look bad by any means. It has a simple design and a neutral color theme that can fit in with just about any build, which I'm sure a lot of you will appreciate. So unless you're looking for flashy colored stripes, RGB LEDs, and an aggressive looking shroud, I'm sure this cooler's looks wouldn't be a deal breaker for most people. So now that I've gone over the details of this card, let's go over some specifications of the test system which this card was tested on. For the CPU, we have an AMD Ryzen 7 1800X overclocked to 4.0GHz paired with a Noctua NHD15 cooler. The memory consists of 16GB of G-Scale Trident Z, clocked at 32MHz, with a cast latency rating of 14. The motherboard used in the system is a Gigabyte Aorus AX370 Gaming 5, and the case housing all these components is a Corsair Air 740. For full system specifications, you can check the details in the video description down below. For reference, and to make things a little more interesting, I've thrown in my GTX 1070 into the benchmarks. Before owning the GTX 1080 Ti, the 1070 was the card I was previously using. This would allow us to see how much faster the GTX 1080 Ti is over a card which is considered to be mid to high end level. In terms of overclocking, the best I could achieve with the 1080 Ti was plus 100 to the core and plus 325 to the memory. This may not look too impressive, however I found that at stock clocks, the 1080 Ti was already boosting itself to around 1924 MHz, which was well above the advertised factory boost clock. With the overclock in place, the card was comfortably boosting to around 2050 MHz. The GTX 1070 on the other hand, had plus 200 to the core and plus 400 onto the memory, allowing the card to boost to around 2100 MHz. So now that all of that's out of the way, it's time we finally jumped into these benchmarks and looked at the results. And there you guys have it. From the results we can see that the GTX 1080 Ti is just an absolute monster at 1440p, and a considerable amount of titles 
with the exception of a few, we were averaging frame rates well above 100 FPS with ultra or very high settings. This is the graphics card which in my opinion is the best companion for a 1440p 144Hz monitor currently on the market. By sacrificing a few graphical options and some compromises, this card will allow me to fully take advantage of the high refresh rate of this monitor. The GTX 1070, although also a pretty fast card, would be perfect if you want to play at just 1440p 60Hz or 1080p 144Hz. But it just wasn't able to deliver a high enough frame rate at 1440p which could allow me to take advantage of the XL2730Z's high refresh rate. From the game averages, the 1080 Ti averaged approximately 120 frames per second. So this now has me very curious and intrigued about its 4K capabilities. I'm sure a lot of you guys would be interested in some 4K benchmarks, so be on the lookout for those in a future video. Now I also just wanted to touch up a bit more on the topics of thermals. As you guys saw from the results, the cooler does a phenomenal job at keeping the temps low. Granted, I do have a case with a lot of airflow, the fact that with the graphics card overclocked, the peak temperatures on the GPU we saw was just 67 degrees Celsius, and in my opinion that's quite impressive. In conclusion, I am very happy with this card, it delivers a very high level of performance and gives me quite a lot of options when it comes to which resolution I want to play my games at. If you're looking for a card that will give you the absolute best performance, offers great cooling performance and doesn't look overkill in, in the aesthetics department, then this card is for you. Well guys, that about wraps up the review of the EVGA GeForce GTX 1080 Ti SC Black Edition. If you enjoyed this review and found it informative, then hit that like button. Let me know any thoughts or comments down below, and if you're interested in seeing more content like this, then make sure you're subscribed. Take care guys, and I'll see you in the next one.